Aloha and welcome to Condo Insider, our weekly show every Thursday at 3 p.m. for board members and homeowners to understand about association living, not just condos, but homeowner associations as well. And uh, we've been doing this show for about three years now and have gotten great reviews. And uh, uh, it's uh, quite an interesting time to uh, try to educate volunteers because certainly they have other things in their life and a lot of people uh, just rely on their management company or or wing it, which can cause problems. Anyway, today I have a very good friend and a guest, a guest whose name is David Levy. And David is a certified public accountant. And um, you know, I keep telling everybody I'm a CPA, but that's because my wife says I'm a certified pain and well, the coli, but I guess that doesn't count. But anyway, um, the, the reality of it is that I know from Hawaii, and David will tell you from his mainland experience, that associations have the uh, potential of fraud or embezzlement in the sense that uh, people can get a hold of your money and uh, steal it, and, and then you may be left holding the bag, which wouldn't be good for the homeowner association. So let me begin by welcoming David. David, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Richard. Thank you for inviting me to Hawaii's premier educational program on television. Well, you, I don't, I don't want to say you're from the mainland because you retired from your CPA firm in California and moved here now. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background, how you got in the industry. I think your firm did the audits for over 4,000 condo associations or associations. And in addition, uh, you're a fraud examiner for the FBI. So tell us a little bit about how you got into all this mess. Sure. Um, well, my family moved to uh, California from Missouri in 1960 when my father took a job with Lockheed Missiles and Space Corporation. Um, I went to school in Northern California, uh, graduated with a degree in accounting from University of California at Berkeley. And uh, I worked for some large national CPA firms for about 10 years before I started my own practice in the mid 1980s. Um, how did I get into the homeowners association industry? Well, in the late 1970s, when I purchased my first uh, condominium, uh, I received a knock on the door from the president of the association who actually happened to be the developer and lived in our 42 unit townhouse project. And uh, he found out what I did. I worked for a CPA firm. So he invited me to join the board and uh, uh, become the treasurer. And uh, my first experience in the industry was a real eye opener. When I went to uh, the first annual meeting uh, as treasurer and I had proposed a special assessment to help fund the reserves. One of the former board members in the audience got up and indignantly told me that uh, when the former board members and owners felt that they needed to have a special assessment, they would let me know. So that was my introduction to the industry. Um, fortunately, over the years subsequent, uh, we've had many clients, more than 4,000, uh, that have listened to our advice. Well, I give you credit because after that welcome, I'm not sure I would have got into the industry. Should have should have been foretelling. It's not an easy industry to get uh, to deal with these kinds of things. You know, that's true. Now, does California do they have requirements that you have to do an audit for a association, or is it really a board's uh, um, choice? Um, that's a good question. Um, the California statute. Uh, currently does require um, a CPA review or a CPA audit if revenues in any given year exceed $75,000. Um, however, that law is trumped by the association's governing documents, which sometimes do call for an audit. Um, so there, there is a legal requirement for either a review or an audit. Well, in Hawaii, just so you know, uh, the law requires associations, condo associations, to do an audit if you have more 20 units or more. 
So a 20 unit condominium has to do an audit. If there are less than 20 units in the association, 19 or less, they still have to do an audit unless at their annual meeting, they vote not to do an audit, then they don't have to do it. But maybe just briefly tell us the difference between a, an audit and a review and a compilation, because Hawaii's got very strict standards and says it's an audit. And so they can't do a review and compilation. So maybe just take a minute and explain what the difference is. Sure. A, a compilation would be uh, the CPA putting the financial data received from management or the treasurer into a format that looks like a review or audit, but the CPA is, is not taking any responsibility for the numbers at all. Um, in a review, it's more or less like the term that we all think of when you talk about reviewing a document. The CPA will look at certain things, financial documents. If it's a good CPA, this, he'll also, he or she will also be reading board minutes to see what's going on, maybe management reports. And then they'll propose some adjusting journal entries, such as accruing additional accounts payable or other, other things. However, in a review, unlike an audit, the CPA is not actually looking at invoices and canceled checks. Uh, in an audit, however, the CPA is responsible for verification of cash balances, as well as uh, doing at least a statistical sampling of transactions, primarily disbursements, looking at canceled checks and invoices to make sure that they're proper. Um, in California, at least in our practice, if let's say a uh, review was a $2,000 job, then an audit might be about 50% more in terms of cost, call it $3,000. So many, many associations would opt for an audit because the CPA is responsible for doing a lot more work than in a review. Well, just for a review on Hawaii, as I said a moment ago, the Hawaii statute for 20 units or more requires the association to do an audit for a condo association. It's not optional. It's part of the uh, annual financial obligations of the board to make sure it's done. And certainly that audit's used to prepare their federal and state income taxes uh, with respect to that. If you're 19 units or less, you still must do an audit. And I see this often misunderstood. Well, we're less than 20, we don't have to do an audit. That's not what the statute says. The statute says that the owners at an annual meeting have to approve not doing the audit for units of 19 or less. So that's kind of what the Hawaii standard is. Now I'm gonna hope, David, you're not gonna ruin my day and tell me that you've seen fraud and embezzlement in condo associations. Well, I'm afraid, Richard, a half an hour wouldn't be enough time for me to go through all of my stories. But uh, I, I thought I, I might start with a small story having to do with the self-managed association, because I know management companies get knocked a lot in this area. Um, in a smaller self-managed association, one of our early fraud or embezzlement cases involved a board treasurer who happened to be an interior designer. And the association's clubhouse needed to be remodeled. So the board said, oh, well, our treasurer has a business, we'll let her do it. So they gave her a budget and uh, she uh, exceeded the budget by a substantial amount of money. And uh, it, it was actually only caught, the, the theft of funds was only caught by an outside bookkeeping company that was doing the books for the association. Um, and uh, it was quite an embarrassment to the other board members because they weren't looking at the check register, which would easily have shown them that the treasurer was taking advantage. And from a CPA standpoint, the lack of internal controls here is very uh, distressing because the board never should have let the contractor that they hired, the treasurer, also be the person who has the ability to pay herself. It, it was uh, unfortunate. Um, yeah, we had a similar situation here in Hawaii. And 
um, with one of our major management companies where the uh, president of the management company was also the treasurer of her condo association and was also the property manager for that property and was also on the board of directors of the condo association. And she basically, uh, she went to jail for this, uh, basically used association funds to pay for her roof on her home and uh, other things along the line and uh, basically coded the invoices so it looked like it was an insurance receivable, like they were doing this work because it was a claim for insurance, right? So mm -hmm. it didn't kind of show up on the income statement side, more of a balance sheet entry about due from insurance company. And so uh, that particular thing was caught uh, actually by the property manager who turned the company president in. And uh, that resulted in an investigation and uh, not only the termination of the president, but uh, she went to jail for a year and a half, I think. But the reality of it is, in that case, the management company paid at its expense for an auditor of the association's choice to come in and audit the books and then wrote them a check for whatever the amount the auditor felt was uh, in dispute. So they didn't end up in a bad situation, but from my experience, that's a rare experience. Yeah, well, the, the lesson that we're putting forth just from our two little examples here is that the ability to spend the money and the accounting for the money need to be separated. If, if those two functions are not kept separate, you're you're in a perfect situation for somebody to take advantage of the association financially. Um, one of the scariest uh, cases that we have worked on with the FBI um, has to do with a management company owner who also uh, performed the bookkeeping, who was able to take money simply by taking signed checks from the association properly signed by the board to a legitimate vendor, turning the check over and saying deposit to her personal bank account. You know, in the old days, most of us thought, well, the bank would turn the check over and look at who's endorsing it. But in today's world, that is not the case. And when I checked with my contact at the FBI, he said, oh yeah, that went out the door a long time ago. Um, now, the obvious question is, well, you know, isn't the person who was supposed to get paid uh, going to complain about it? Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure that they will. But then again, the manager has the ability to push away vendors that uh, she didn't want. So well, what's changed? I can tell you from my own uh, analysis and discussion with banks is that we've become a very electronic world. So they don't have the ability to read restrictive endorsements on the back of a check. Uh, in fact, uh, from a banking point of view, you may do this as an internal control process, but from a banking point of view, uh, if you say you have to have two signatures on a check, they don't monitor that because these checks go through these high-speed processors very quickly. And they're taking, if it's got one valid signature on the account, they're processing their check. And if they're leaving it up to you to look at your bank statement and see if there's any uh, mistakes with regard to that. So, well, we've become a very, very electronic world. And so those types of protections uh, aren't uh, available to us anymore. And believe it or not, we're at the halfway point, David. And so we're going to take a one minute break and come back and talk about another couple of your examples and, and look for some recommendations of what to do. So we'll be Great. right back in one minute. Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper and welcome to Cooper Union. We look at what's happening with human rights around the world. And we invite you to tune in every Tuesday where we feature the voices of the people from the front lines sharing the struggles for self-determination, for the importance of sustainability 
and solidarity with one another to make the world a better place for all of humanity. If you can't catch it live, you can also look at thinktechhawaii.com as well as on Vimeo and many other places to catch the amazing shows where we hear from authors, activists, academics, analysts, and artists who are contributing to positive social change around the planet. Aloha Mekapono, thank you for joining us for Justice. Welcome back to Condo Insider. I'm with my good friend, David Levy, a certified public accountant who uh, is from California, has practiced having handled more than 4,000 associations and a fraud examiner for the FBI, but happily has moved here to Honolulu and is a good friend. And uh, I've asked him to talk about embezzlement and fraud. Uh, before the break, we were talking about banking and the fact that uh, it's important you have controls on who can write the checks and who can sign them and who can approve the invoices. And they probably shouldn't be the same person. So you have some checks and balances. Interesting in what most larger associations, their declaration requires them, the board, the association, to hire what is legally called a managing agent under Hawaii law. And that managing agent has the obligation and usually processes the routine bills and the ones that are kind of uh, out of the ordinary uh, takes it to the board and puts it in the board minutes to be approved. So um, we have that layer of, uh, of uh, protection if you have a managing agent. Uh, but let me assure you, managing agents are not uh, free from doing something illegal as well, although it would be a rare occurrence. I would want to add one more thing is under Hawaii, the association and the managing agent separately are required to buy a fidelity bond or crime policy to cover uh, misappropriation by either the association employees or the managing agents employees. And uh, the problem with that law is, is that the, uh, the requirements for the, uh, the level of insurance is quite low. That's like $500 a unit. So if you have um, 25 units, you have a, only a $12,500 requirement for a limit of liability. Although uh, most management companies and the bigger ones carry millions of dollars to cover themselves for that. But anyway, David, back to you. And you were telling us about some examples. Give us another example of your experience with, with the sure. bad guys. Another, another case we worked on with the FBI uh, uh, involved if again, a property management company owner and some of his staff where uh, funds were being taken by altering not only the uh, financial statements, but also the, uh, the bank statements. Now, in the old days, people would say, well, you know, you get out your typewriter and your little whiteout and you, you make an adjustment and it, you think, well, it's going to be visible. So uh, in this particular case, I went to a computer expert, my niece, who told me, she says, well, Uncle David, you know, today you get this particular computer program, which I will not mention on this broadcast, and you simply scan the original bank statement, and you can alter the numbers printed out, and you can't tell the difference from the original bank statement. And that's exactly what was happening. And in this particular case, um, you might say, well, why is the FBI involved in something like this? Well, it turned out that the first victim got their money back and was unwilling to file a police report. And even though the local district attorney, San Francisco, was more than willing to uh, take the case, they, they said they couldn't without a complaint. But I knew from my prior experience with the FBI that they did not have to have a complainant per se. And so the FBI did investigate this case, and this was the, uh, the second case that I was involved with them where it, it in fact, went to uh, federal court. The FBI spent three, three years investigating. The U.S. Attorney's Office sat on the case for about two years. It went to court, and unfortunately, the perpetrator did not get any jail time. Um, However, because the perpetrator also managed about 100 apartment buildings, 
you might say, well, let's see, if he's stealing from homeowners associations, what's he doing with, for instance, the security deposits on all these apartment buildings? Well, um, we got the um, state of California to take a look at it. And sure enough, he had taken about a million dollars worth of tenant deposits. What's the lesson here for board members though? The, ma the main lesson here is the necessity to review financial statements. While it's a rare instance that somebody would go to the extent of actually altering bank statements, um, it could happen. The, the easy solution to that is to have the bank send a copy of the bank statement directly to the treasurer. I don't know how feasible that is in Hawaii, but it would, it would take care of the problem with somebody altering the statements. Um, and another instance, which uh, Richard, you may wanna comment on as well, before the show, we talked about the fact that even, even for board members who are not accountants, everybody can read a check register. And in fact, in California, only a few years ago, um, the state legislature um, made a list of uh, financial documents that all board members are supposed to look at uh, on a monthly basis, including the check registers, basic financial statements, and something called the general ledger. Um, for those who are not accountants, um, the general ledger is, is a basic accounting document for which all transactions are entered. So from the general ledger, you could get a printout, for instance, of all the uh, expenditures uh, in other maintenance or office expense for any period of time that you ask for. And CPAs routinely look at the year-to-date general ledger at the end of the year because it's easy to spot miscodings or on occasion, uh, transactions that might even be fraudulent. So uh, the check register at a minimum, I think is important. Yeah, I tell most of the condo clients and boards who don't have a lot of uh, accounting experience uh, that the number one document, if you're concerned about fraud or theft, is the general or is the check register, because you should be able to go through the check register, a chronological number of the checks that were issued, and be able to say, oh, that's the electric company, that makes sense, or that's the ABC maintenance. I've never heard of them, but every week we're writing a check to ABC maintenance for $100. Well, who's ABC maintenance and say, well, I'd like to see the invoices to back it up. You know, um, so <clears throat> to me, for a simplified accountant, the check register is probably the uh, uh, most important document. I mean, uh, certainly there's value to all the documents, but uh, I tell everybody always, you're worried about who's spending the money, what you're spending it on, get the check register. That'll give you the best handle on things. You agree? I definitely agree. And, uh, Another another situation that Richard and I both had uh, examples of, unfortunately, um, this this case did not involve the FBI because the perpetrator was dead when the fraud was uh, discovered. Had to do with a property manager who managed a couple of dozen accounts in Northern California and invented a fictitious maintenance company, and because he had a great degree of influence over the payment of bills, uh, he would direct payments on a regular basis to this small maintenance company, usually odd amounts, less than $1,000. And over a period of a couple of decades, it appears to have gotten away with a couple of million dollars. And uh, even though the management company he worked for was a very good one and had a good accounting department, uh, even once the embezzlement was discovered, um, you know, the people in the accounting department said, look, we deal with thousands of vendors. We, we, we don't necessarily know every one of them. So once again, the board of directors, as we were just saying, needs to look at check registers. And if you don't recognize a vendor, ask questions, you know, um, don't, don't just accept a piece of paper uh, as being correct because it was handed to you. One of the other things I think was interesting you said earlier, you talked about uh, with the software, you can take a bank statement and alter it. So it looks like a real bank statement. In Hawaii, just so all your listeners know, 
in addition to the annual audit, you have a requirement by the CPA you hired to do an annual surprise cash verification. That is, they come in without any announcement to the management company or the uh, on-site manager, whoever is keeping your books, and does a litmus test that the amount he's reporting on the financial statements or the company's reporting the financial statement matches what's really in the bank account. So uh, if in fact that uh, 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 that's done properly, you probably mitigate the ability to, to uh, fudge the bank statements. That keeps somebody from um, uh, running in and moving money from one association to another at the last minute to cover the shortfall because it's a surprise verification unannounced where they come into the office. So, so what's your, uh, we we're down to the last two minutes here. So what's your number word of advice to, to your, our volunteer board members out there? I would, I would say this, um, when you keep board minutes or you review board minutes, make sure you're leaving a good trail for your auditor as to what uh, expenditures you approved to who, for what, and how much, and if it's a very large contract that involves change orders, make sure that you put that into the board minutes as well. The, the minutes act as a good trail for anyone looking over the financial activities of the association after the fact. Well, I wanna thank you for being here today. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as fiduciary board members need to understand their financial statements, and they certainly need to be on the lookout for any misuse of the funds that uh, uh, would harm the association. And, and the things we've given you, the tips we've given you today may cause you to think, but get the check register, look at the checks, make sure your minutes are accurate and comprehensive and uh, hire a good CPA that you can rely on and depend on uh, to bounce questions off of. So on that note, I wanna thank David Levy for being here today. I'm Richard, thank you, Richard. your host. And uh, we look forward to next week. And I think our next week, our, um, our uh, host is either Jane Sugimura or Raylene Tenno, uh, who will do the show on Condo Insider. Thanks for watching. Aloha.